Well, the expiry date discovered coincides with the preliminary findings of a study led by the universities of Witwatersrand and Oxford. They show that the AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine does not appear to offer protection against mild and moderate infections caused by the variant identified here in South Africa. The principal investigator of South Africa's COVID-19 vaccine trial, Professor Shabi Amadi says the vaccine appears to be mostly ineffective against the new variant. What I also need to emphasize is that it's not all doom and gloom. Uh, again, these are results that were reported about a week ago, and this is a Novavax study, Novavax vaccine, which is a different vaccine using a different sort of a formulation and technology. And these were results specifically from South Africa, where in a similar sort of uh, demographic uh, as what was enrolled in the AstraZeneca vaccine trial, relatively young individuals with a median age of about, 40, about uh, 35, 36, what we observed in the Novavax study was a 60% reduction against mild and moderate COVID-19 due to the B1351 variant. Uh, when including people with HIV in that analysis, that efficacy estimate drops to about 50% reduction, but there isn't much to be made between the 50 and 60% because of the uncertainty bounds of the estimates that surround that particular number. So yes, unfortunately, the AstraZeneca vaccine does not work against mild to moderate illness, but we do have vaccines that work against mild and moderate illness, including the variant that's circulating in South Africa. And for all the COVID vaccines that have currently been authorized, it shows a very similar sort of a trend that vaccines that work against mild and moderate illness generally will have higher efficacy or a greater level of protection against more severe disease. Professor Mahdi also says the AstraZeneca vaccine could still have a role to play in the country as it has shown some positive results. South Africa has now already received a million doses of uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine and might this vaccine still have some role to play, uh, if not to protect against mild to moderate infection. And I think the data are fairly compelling that it will not protect against mild infection especially. But might there be reason to be optimistic that these vaccines might still be of some use in at least protecting against severe COVID-19? And again, these are data that were shared with the public in the past week, where we know that a single dose of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, uh, where South Africa was one of, few participating, uh, one of few participating countries in that particular trial, but specifically to the efficacy or the effectiveness of that vaccine that was observed in South Africa, what was noted was a 57% reduction in moderate to severe disease and an 89% reduction in terms of the risk of severe disease and, and death in South Africa. And the majority of these cases that would have occurred in South Africa again would have been due to the B1351 variant. Well, joining us now is Professor Shabir Mahdi, Director of uh, the Vaccines Research Unit at uh, Wits University and Chief Investigator in the South African Trials. And uh, Prof, thank you very much for uh, giving us your time. Firstly, congratulations are in order for being uh, appointed the Dean of uh, the Health Faculty at Wits University. But perhaps let's start, Prof, with that very last point you made in that soundbite. So, these vaccines that are in South Africa right now, they do not seem to uh, protect against mild and moderate symptoms, but they do seem to be effective against uh, severe symptoms. Uh, explain that difference to us. So, uh, good morning to you. And I think wh what we need to appreciate uh, is that what's required of a vaccine to be able to protect against an upper airway infection might be very different uh, compared to what is required to protect against uh, severe disease, which essentially is uh, infection of the lung itself when it comes to SARS-CoV-2. Now, at this stage, we don't have compelling evidence that a vaccine will protect against severe disease. Uh, as you mentioned, we know that it doesn't protect against mild and moderate infection due to the variant that's currently circulating in South Africa, which is becoming globally dispersed. Mm -hmm. But the reason for this extrapolation is that the AstraZeneca vaccine 
is very similar in terms of the technology that's been used to design the vaccine compared to the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Mm. In addition to which, uh, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine and the AstraZeneca vaccine have, very got, have got very comparable immune responses that are induced. Yeah. What we've seen with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, when it was evaluated in a different age group demographic and individuals at high risk of developing severe disease, they were able to show 89% reduction against severe disease due to the variant that's currently circulating in South Africa. So we believe that all things being equal, the AstraZeneca vaccine will very likely perform as well or similarly to the Johnson & Johnson vaccine when it comes to protecting against severe disease. Yeah. But it would require recalibration in terms of what we expect of COVID-19 vaccines and who it is that we focus on getting immunized as soon as possible. You talk about... Uh, recalibration and that's the point I want to pick up on because uh, Oxford University and AstraZeneca uh, say that they've started adapting the vaccine uh, against this variant that is found in their country and this is all in an effort to advance it rapidly through the clinical development uh, so that it is ready for delivery in autumn but South Africans Certainly, I would want to know this, Prof. What do we do with the one million batch that is in our storage facilities right now? So I think the start to that answer is that these vaccines have been shown to be safe. And I think that's the premise from which we need to proceed. Mm -hmm. That these vaccines are close on to 20, after being evaluated in close on to 18,000 individuals has been proven to be safe. So the next step now is to determine who might be who might still uh, develop some uh, benefit from being vaccinated, mm -hmm. and the group that derive, that stands to derive immediate benefit from being vaccinated without being put at risk are people that are at high risk of developing severe disease. So this is not a vaccine that should be rolled out to healthcare workers mm -hmm. that are not at risk of developing severe disease that might be infected, but usually infections are moderate illness because this vaccine is not going to protect healthcare workers against the variant that's currently circulating in South Africa. Sure. But the vaccine certainly has potential developing severe disease. So in addition to healthcare workers, we probably should now start considering expanding the immunization to other individuals that remain at high risk of developing severe disease. Mm -hmm. Because in all likelihood, South Africa is going to experience another resurgence uh, in the course of the next few months, around about May to June. Yeah. And we can't leave it for too late to vaccinate people once a resurgence is upon us. So my suggestion at this point in time is that the current lot of vaccine be repurposed specifically for individuals at high risk of developing severe disease. Yeah, okay. So they can be used to, to, to those individuals who are experiencing severe symptoms right now, but there is the element of the expiry date, Professor. And that is that in April, they will expire uh, if what uh, you told us last night and the health minister, of course, uh, is to be taken on board. So you vaccinate now. It's a two dose vaccine. By the time that April is come and gone, those would have received the first jab. Will they not be at risk if they can't get a second jab that will be required at whatever time that they will need it. So I missed some part of your question, but I think I picked up the tail end of it. Uh, and the answer is that yes, the vaccine that's currently available to South Africa, the expiry date is the end of April, uh, but a company can do stability testing to see whether that expiry date can be extended. But that aside, if we can get the vaccine that is available to us, if we can start immunizing people and complete uh, immunization with these 1 million doses by April, mm. uh, come May, June onwards, we are going to have other vaccines that are going to become available. And it might be the AstraZeneca vaccine or it might be other vaccines. So there are currently studies underway. And I'm fairly optimistic that those studies will come through in that there can be some level of interchangeability between vaccines. So I don't think uh, that we should delay vaccination. Mm -hmm. And come May, June, uh, we probably will have a second vaccine available for the same high-risk groups, and it can be boosted, hopefully yeah. before the resurgence uh, occurs in South Africa. So in the meantime, Professor, what does government say to anxious health workers who were readying themselves 
uh, to receive these jabs because that's a prolonged wait for them and that means that you know they will continue to suffer the consequences of this pandemic how soon perhaps can they expect the johnson and johnson vaccine so I think the minister mentioned last night, as a Prof. Gray, that the Johnson & Johnson vaccine in some reasonable number of quantity will become available as soon as possibly in a week or two from now. Uh, fortunately, what's happened with the epidemic in South Africa is that we're very much on a downward trajectory in terms of the current resurgence, which means that even healthcare workers are now becoming less susceptible to being infected. But it's key that we actually get people immunized with the best vaccine that is available to us before we experience the next resurgence. Mm. So I think there is some breathing space uh, simply because of the manner in which the current epidemic is unfolding with us being on a downward trajectory. So I'm not too concerned that we don't have a health vaccine for healthcare workers in the next few days, but certainly there will be one available to them in the next few weeks. Yeah. Okay. So while we wait for uh, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, Talk to us, Prof, about the vaccines that seem to be effective, in particular against the variant that is found here, whether it be uh, the Moderna or Pfizer, Sputnik V, that is uh, developed in Russia, uh, Sinovac, China. Have we tested these vaccines against this uh, very variant? So the only vaccine that's currently uh, that's been shown to be effective in South Africa against mild to moderate infection, in fact, is a Novavax vaccine, uh, not a Sputnik vaccine, not the Moderna vaccine, not the Pfizer vaccine. In fact, in fact, the experiments in the laboratory for the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine clearly indicates that those vaccines too will be affected uh, in terms of efficacy when it comes to the variant. So it might not be as effective as the AstraZeneca vaccine, but those vaccines are not going to have 90 and 95 percent protection in South Africa against mild and moderate illness. Mm. Uh, it's probably going to be similar to what we observe for the Novavax vaccine, which has got uh, efficacy of about 60 percent against mild to moderate infection. Uh, the Sputnik vaccine is uh, really sort of, in a sense, uncharted territory in South Africa in that there's no study that's been done on that. Mm -hmm. And before we introduce any of these vaccines, we're going to need to be conscious as to what we've experienced with the AstraZeneca vaccine. And we need to start phasing in its, uh, we need to start phasing it in in such a way that we can get an early readout, be it from testing in the laboratory, coupled with uh, clinical testing to see whether these vaccines are holding up when it comes to protecting against uh, COVID-19, mm. uh, both for a full spectrum of disease, because if the vaccines don't work against mild illness, then we need to be looking at how to protect against severe disease. Yeah, Prof, I realize that uh, there is a, a phone call coming in. I'm sure you are a very uh, busy man, but can I just ask you for uh, a quick, quick, quick um, uh, short break that I'm going to take now while you attend to that phone call. And I want to ask you, uh, the issue around whether or not we as South Africans should take collective uh, responsibility for pressuring government to urgently acquire these vaccines. I are you available? So unfortunately, I've got another interview which is coming in right now. <laughs> so unfortunately, I'm going to need to pass on that one. All right. Well, let me get it through to you now then. Otherwise, I'm going to uh, be fired here. Uh, should we take blame, Prof, for pressuring government to acquire a vaccine or were we justified in our uh, outrage against the delays? Well, I think we were fully justified uh, in our outrage in terms of government not acting to procure vaccine early enough. Uh, the fact that this has happened, no one could have second guessed it. And if we wait to basically make a decision on when a vaccine eventually is shown to be efficacious against a variant, we rest assured we'll be waiting in perpetually. Uh, because by the time the vaccine is shown to be effective against the variant, there'll be another long waiting queue. Mm. Unfortunately, what the situation demands of us is risk taking. We need to understand that we are going to be thrown curve balls like what we've experienced this time around. Mm. But we need to be brave enough to take on this risk so that when that vaccine does become available, we can have access to that vaccine as early as possible. Government was not incorrect. The scientific community was not incorrect. The public was not incorrect in terms of insisting that we get government to act to procure vaccines as quickly as possible because we were falling behind. Yeah. If we allow us, if we're wanting to wait for that first vaccine that is shown to be effective against the variant to become available before we engage in bilaterals, 
uh, then we will end up getting a vaccine probably in 2023. Mm -hmm. So I think we just need to be more pragmatic in terms of the type of uh, situation we're facing. And we need to understand that everything comes with the risk, including procuring COVID vaccines. Professor Shabir Mahdi, thank you very much uh, indeed for your insights. Always uh, a pleasure talking to you, Professor uh, Shabir Mahdi. He is uh, the chief investigator of uh, the trials that were conducted here in South Africa.